My name's Tanya Hudson. I'm the Director of Development and Communications here at the Lions Eye Institute. I'd firstly like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting today, the Wajak Noongar people and their elders past, present and future. I'd also just quickly like to let you know the logistics for the morning. So shortly we'll hear from Professor Bill Morgan. We'll then have some time at the end of his presentation for questions and answers. There's then tea and coffee and some biscuits outside. So please help yourself and browse through our research display. Um, and then please feel free to stay on for our next lecture, uh, which is at 11.30 and that's Dr. Andrea Ang. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to a man who's been a mainstay here at the Institute for more than 25 years, but he's been in the role of Managing Director uh, just this year. Professor Bill Morgan is a glaucoma specialist and board member of the Lion's Eye Institute. He's also a consultant ophthalmologist at Royal Perth Hospital and Perth Children's Hospital, professor at UWA and co-director of the LEI at McCusker Glaucoma Centre. And one of our projects here is to try and clone him clearly because um, he's also a top researcher uh, as I'll tell you about in a little while so he's an incredibly uh, busy man a fabulous leader at the institute and we're very very lucky to have him and how he fits it all in is beyond me so Professor Morgan co-invented the Zen gel stent which is a surgical invention which um, has been revolutionizing the treatment of glaucoma all over the world I think there's over a hundred thousand have now been implanted and also the Verna, which is an affordable tube solution for glaucoma that's helping to save the sight of people in, up in Indonesia. He'll tell you a little bit more about that. He's also working with NASA in the US, um, among other global collaborators, and he's going to tell you some more about his work that's challenging that critical part of our bodies, the optic nerve. So without further ado, please welcome Professor Bill Morgan. Thanks very much, Tanya. And look, thank you all for coming. It's uh, a bit intimidating, actually. But I, fortunately, I know many of you. And uh, so I'll start. I thought I'd chat about pressures on the eye. And I've got several aims with the talk today. And I'm going to introduce you to some characters who you'll meet later on in the talk. Bottom left is Captain Butch Wilmore. Now, none of you will know Butch Wilmore, but you'll be seeing him later on in the talk and you'll understand why he's in this talk. Top right is a patient that I operated on almost 25 years ago, born with congenital glaucoma of a rare sort who needed special tube surgery to keep her vision. And she's kept her vision now for more than 20 years and managed to go through schooling bottom right is a very unfortunate baby I met up in Bali when I first started going there about 15 years ago. She, this baby's six, well at the time the photograph was taken, six months of age, totally opaque corneas and totally blind with no chance of ever seeing. So, and unfortunately at that time there was no chance of remedial surgery so unfortunately the two children had very different trajectories and I'll get on to that. But one of the aims of the talk is to turn you all into pressure experts. It's probably nothing, not a thing you've ever really aspired to do, but put everything aside, all those other aspirations for life that you might have, travel plans, etc. This hour, you'll become pressure experts. And when, it's, when you're talking about pressure, one of the simplest analogies is imagine that you're a scuba diver and you're going to dive down into the ocean's deep. Now, on the surface of the water, of the ocean, the atmospheric pressure is 760 millimetres of mercury, and that's the sort of average pressure throughout your body. When you dive down 10 metres, it basically doubles so that all of a sudden the pressure throughout your body is 1,500 millimetres of mercury. That's a fair whack increase in pressure. And also, if you happen to live at altitude, for example, in Boulder, Colorado, about 1,600 metres altitude, atmospheric pressure there is 630 millimetres of mercury. So that's about 130 millimetres mercury less than it is at sea level, and that's what your average pressure is through your body. Now, many of you have heard about the disease called glaucoma, which is a pressure disease, 
and you would think, oh, wow, let's go and live in Boulder, Colorado, pressure's going to be less. Well, I'm afraid it's not that simple, and you'll see why. And by the end of this talk, you'll understand why, because you will all be pressure experts. Now, the problem with pressure is it's not the absolute or average pressure that matters. It's the pressure difference across a tissue or a structure that actually counts. When you have a difference in pressure, it exerts a force. A bit like when you blow up a balloon, you're imposing a pressure inside that balloon which forces the skin of the balloon apart and gives it a force. So that's why the balloon becomes tense and more tense as you blow it up. Same as the eyeball. Now, what the weak point of your eyeball is the very back, the hole in the eye, which lets the one million or so nerve fibres out back to the brain, a bit like a giant video cable. And so what really counts here is whether there's much of a pressure difference in this zone, because if there is, there's going to be a large force tending to distort those little nerve fibres. And what determines that pressure difference is two things, the pressure in the eye itself, but also the pressure behind, because that determines the difference. The pressure behind is brain fluid pressure. We have a, like all doctors, we have a fancy name for that. That's called cerebrospinal fluid pressure or CSF pressure for short. And I'm going to use that phrase only because brain fluid pressure or cerebrospinal fluid pressure is such a mouthful, I'm going to say CSF pressure. It's easier to say, and I'm a bit lazy when it comes to talking. So what you'll see at the bottom of this picture is the normal situation on the bottom left where the nerve looks sort of juicy and there's a pressure differential across the back of the nerve. And to the right is a schematic of what the optic nerve looks like in glaucoma where the pressure has risen and it's gradually crushed the nerve fibres over some years usually, although it can be faster, and ended up creating a type of crater effect where the remnant nerve tissue is left and the vision is drastically reduced. I'll, I'll get into that in more detail. Now, this is when the pressure in the eye becomes greater than CSF pressure. You can get the opposite situation where CSF pressure becomes greater than the eye pressure. So that's the bottom left here. And what happens there is that the, the swelling and the pressure comes from behind forwards, pushing, pushing everything forwards. And so you get a condition called papilledema, and I'll show you some photographs of that. But we'll go back to glaucoma. This is what, if you understand this picture, you basically understand glaucoma. And we're not, I'm not expecting you to understand glaucoma, but I just thought you'd like to see some pictures. Now, if I can... Well, here we go. So this is a normal optic nerve. If you cut a section through it, this is very, very early glaucoma. There's a little bit of thinning of the nerve tissue here. And this is advanced glaucoma. What you see, it's becoming like a crater, and the tissue that supports the nerve fibres has become compressed and thinned. These days, we don't have to take your eye out, cut it open, cut sections to get this type of picture. Uh, we had trouble in the past. Not many, we didn't get many volunteers. We, even, though, even though I'd give these sorts of talks and then try and encourage people to participate, I was uniformly unsuccessful. But fortunately, clever guys invented optical coherence tomography or OCT scanning and... This is the scans we get. So we get these optical sections, if you like, and you'll see this is the normal situation. This is early glaucoma. This is advanced glaucoma. And you see how similar it looks. Gives you beautiful measurements of the thickness of the nerve tissue and how distorted things are. This is what it looks like when we look in the back of your eyes. Healthy, juicy nerve tissue here, kind of almost like a peach. You feel like you could munch into it, but we don't. And this is unfortunately end stage where you've lost that peachy coloured nerve tissue and it's excavated. And this is what's happening to your vision during that process. Normal visual field except for a little blind spot, which is quite normal. Early visual field loss and early glaucoma becoming more advanced until it's really quite devastating with just a tiny 
island of vision in the centre and that becomes very difficult to see with and you trip over stairs, you can't walk around in public easily, you can't recognise faces and it's hard to see things. Uh, Dr Chandra Balaratna Singh and Professor you and I did some work some years ago where we looked at what was going on in the optic nerve and looking at the structure in the optic nerve in glaucoma compared to normals. And this is what's going on. This is the normal eye. And these are what we call cytoskeletal elements. These are like tram tracks which allow the nerve to communicate with the back of the brain, sending signals down. And what you'll notice is that these tram tracks are drastically reduced here. The orange colour is basically almost eliminated when you have moderate glaucoma. Also, these are some experiments from some animal work we did, where if you elevate intraocular pressure uh, in, on the right-hand columns uh, and make a stain for what's called mitochondrial activity, which are the little engines in the nerves that churn up energy and allow the nerves to function, when you elevate pressure, not only is there all those distorting forces occurring, but it's forcing the nerve to become much more active, to basically pump material up and down that gradient. And this is illustrated by the amount of enzyme activity going on in the mitochondria here, which is much more intensely stained than on the normal side. So the poor nerve, it's a bit like it's got to run uphill all day, doesn't get a chance to have a rest, and it's under pressure, and it's being crushed all at the same time. So that's the effect of pressure. And I will show you this other slide. This is taken from a very famous pathology work done in the 70s by Professor Vrabek from Czechoslovakia then. And it shows you what's going on in the optic nerve head when you have glaucoma. These are interrupted axons. So when they get tired of having to work so hard with the pressure and the distortion, they basically fracture and then they try and heal and you get these little outpouchings of growth, what we call growth cones, little axons trying to grow out and connect back again. But unfortunately, they're uniformly unsuccessful. And then after that, they basically die back. So the little nerve fibres die back. And so over time, you lose the nerve fibres. So what can we do about glaucoma? Firstly, what are the major risk factors that we can perhaps modify? Well, you'll all know that pressure in the eye is a major factor. And this is your risk of getting glaucoma if you don't have it already, uh, according to what your intraocular pressure is. And what you'll notice is that if we assign a relative risk of one, if you have a pressure less than 16, that relative risk doubles between 16 and 19, quadruples 20 to 25, goes up by tenfold if you have a pressure 26 to 30 and 40 fold if you have a pressure greater than 30. That curve is not a line, so it's not linear. It's what we call an exponential curve. See how it's going like that? So that's a very important function. It's a nasty function. It means that if you have a pressure greater than 30, you're at much, 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 much greater risk of getting damage. That's why we get worried when we see patients with higher pressures. It underlies the whole treatment strategy for glaucoma as well. So if you imagine there's a line that we fit to this, when we see a patient newly diagnosed with a certain pressure, what we want to do is lower their pressure and shift them back along this curve into this sort of safer zone here so that hopefully they won't get damage, further damage down the track. So the whole treatment aim is to shift, if you have glaucoma, your pressure back to a safer zone. So that's what we're doing. I won't actually uh, labour on this point too much, but interestingly, not everyone with a high pressure necessarily gets glaucoma. So it is what we call a true risk factor. This is the distribution of pressures in the normal population with an average around about 15. And the little white bars here are newly diagnosed glaucoma patients their pressures at diagnosis and the mean is about 20. So you can see there's a shift towards a higher pressure 
but you can get glaucoma even when your pressure is in what we call the normal range. And that has to do with if you're unlucky and have a weak optic nerve. And unfortunately, the main reason why people have weak optic nerves is if you're very short-sighted, it affects the tissue support to the optic nerve. Finally, there are some racial and genetic differences so and age differences. So this is the incidence of glaucoma with age. You can see it's uh, prevalence is down to about in, uh, I should say, sort of Caucasians. In our, most of our population, it's less than 1% if you're less than 40. But you can see how it goes up to end up being about towards 5% if you're about 90 years of age. However, that uh, risk is massively increased in people from Africa, so particularly West Africans, and significantly increased in people from Southeast Asia in particular for various reasons, some of which are genetic. Now, what, what do we do? Um, this is um, traditional glaucoma surgery, trabeculectomy. We, now, we don't go straight for surgery, but I'm going to go straight for surgery because I like operating. No, we, we always start with drops generally and a laser, but if that all fails, if you're getting worse, losing your vision and you want something more done, you don't want to go blind, then we have to go for surgery. Now, this is a trabeculectomy. This is the surgery that was first described in 1968 and is still most parts of the world standard. So you can see it's had a long life, about 50 years, and it's fairly, for want of a better word, brutal in the sense there's a lot of dissection of your eye and it's a big wound that we create. It's quite a big hole that we create in your eye. And we're aiming to create a sort of shortcut for the fluid to get out of your eye. If you look here, create a channel so the fluid can get out and form what we call a bleb or a swelling of tissue where the fluid then magically disappears away. And not magically, it goes into little lymphatics. So now I've probably put you off morning tea. I'll quickly go on to another slide. Um, but you'll see how, if you like, crude that sort of surgery is. Back in uh, the mid-1990s, Professor Yu, Professor Kringle and I did talk about what we would like to see as an ideal glaucoma operation. And really we wanted one that created minimal damage to the eye. You can see from that previous video that there's actually a lot of damage with the trabeculectomy. We want the most effective surgeries are where we create a drain into the tissue that surrounds the eye. We wanted it to last a long time and was, could be repeated ideally. This is a photograph of Professor Yu, who is the, the genius and the, the brains and the brawn behind this work. It started with a donation from the McCusker family back in about 1996. Seed funded some early work. Uh, Professor Yu brought a biochemical oven. We brought the glutaraldehyde, the uh, collagen, and started cross-linking that to form tubes. And we started testing that in animals and eventually took that through to China to larger animals just to prove it was safe and it worked. And finally, Professor Yu managed to negotiate with a uh, venture capital firm from the United States. Unfortunately, in those days, we were unable to get a, a firm, an Australian firm, interested to uh, do the commercialization. This is uh, just from the, the patent we wrote back in 1996, illustrating the technique. Uh, he and uh, Professor Kringle developed a robotic surgical system to do the original implantation in small animals. Small animals have got small eyes, are in fact more difficult to operate upon than humans and require finer degrees of control. And that required the development of specialized surgical techniques. Interestingly, surgery in general is probably heading towards more robotic surgery. And so we've got a great interest in developing these techniques even further for both glaucoma and retinal surgery in particular. Now this shows you the operation as it currently stands. This is a Zen operation and over 100,000 have been introduced. 
you'll see the injection system. And we, uh, we developed our own special lens so you can actually see the angle. You can see the system, the injection system going into the angle. You'll see it just poking up through the sclera under the conjunctiva here. And it's going to, I'm going to deliver the tiny little stent under the conjunctiva and the needle injection system is slowly withdrawn in a controlled fashion to deliver the stent from the, what we call the front of the eye, the anterior chamber, through to this space under the tissue here, the subconjunctival space. That's the operation. Now, it has the same effect and results as a trabeculectomy, but you can see that it's a much less damaging operation patients recover much faster um, and essentially if it was my eye that's what I'd want rather than a trabeculectomy. Um, now in the original human trials we did we started those back in 2007 here and these are photographs taken from one of the early patients over a two-year period showing the stent in the anterior chamber, and some of you can just see it here under the conjunctiva. I'll show you some other photographs too. And this is taken using a fancy lens inside the eye, showing the stent inside the eye. Now those stents, the original stents, were 220 microns in diameter, external diameter, 120 microns internal diameter. These are the pressure results we were getting. And the average pre-op pressure was about 25, dropping down to about 14, 13. And we've published that data recently out to about seven years. So quite good average results. Of course, some people fail, but average results are actually quite good. Comparable to trabeculectomy, this is our results, what we call the Kaplan-Meier survival curve. And if you just be aware that the uh, the follow-up time here is seven years. This is a nice paper published from the United Kingdom if you compare it to the seven-year data. Now, all of our patients had had both trabeculectomies and cataracts prior to this study. So the comparison graph is actually the trabeculectomy or ECCP, which I mean, they're roughly comparable. So roughly comparable to a trabeculectomy. Now, nothing's perfect. Some patients do fail and some people get blebs, that is that surface tissue which scars and does funny things. And we have to give injections of an anti-scarring chemical quite commonly to try and keep them working. So we've got current questions that we really want to try and answer. Uh, one is how can we make the surgery better and more predictable? How can we reduce scarring and how can we encourage the little lymphatic vessels to grow in. They're like the body's own little vacuum cleaners that grow in from all sorts of different directions and they're vital for taking that fluid away. So how can we encourage that? So that's ongoing work that we're actively pursuing at the moment. And then there are more uh, simple surgical uh, questions. For example, how can we try and guarantee ideal positioning of the stent this is what we call an anterior segment OCT scan, showing the stent going through the sclera. This is the sclera here, into the anterior chamber. You can't, it's just gone out of focus, but it is actually going into the anterior chamber. So fluid passes along the stent right to here, flows out, and you see all these little bubbly things. They're actually lymphatic vessels. So they're working in this patient. It's, it's a nice functioning working zen. Now I'm going to finish there. Um, so we're, we're not resting on our laurels regarding the gelatin stent. We really do want to improve it and there are definitely ways in which we can and we've been fantastically well supported by many of you in fact. Some of you are on trials that we have at the moment looking at the outcomes of Zen surgery. Some of you have supported us financially. So all, we're incredibly grateful for your ongoing support. Now I'm going to shift focus a little bit to what about those patients who fail basic surgery? And there are a group, unfortunately, uh, and it's unfortunately much more common up in Indonesia where the glaucoma is much more severe. Now, those patients need what's called a glaucoma drainage device. This was first invented by 
Anthony Moltino from South Africa back in 1968. This is actually, you're seeing me operate on that, per, that baby's eye. Remember you saw that child who's now 25 in one of the first photographs. This is a baby I'm operating on. I'm putting a glaucoma drainage device in a six month old. This baby has very severe glaucoma. No other sort of surgery or treatment will work. They'll end up with opaque blind eyes if we don't do this sort of surgery. This is the kind of brilliance of Anthony Moltino's device that made treating these patients possible and, and saving their vision. Now, the problem is that each one of those devices costs about a thousand US dollars and simply too expensive for people in the developing world, like in Indonesia, where glaucoma is very common. There's about a 2.3% prevalence across the population. 0.2% of the population there are blind, by both eyes blind from glaucoma. Very high failure rate for trabeculectomy. So, and so there's a much greater need for this type of surgery. But the need is for a system which can be easily implanted by a general surgeon, a eye, eye surgeon, as well as low cost. So I had a wonderful young Indonesian ophthalmologist working with me about seven years ago, Dr. Verna Oktariana, and she wanted to do a PhD. And we settled on this particular project I said, why don't we try and make a glaucoma drainage device that can be manufactured in Indonesia using cheap materials, make it for about a tenth of the current cost, and then make it available across the country. So that was the brief. We wanted to particularly save the vision in this type of patient. So remember, this is the baby from Bali compared to the child here. So now. There are various materials that you can use to make a glaucoma drainage device from. One of the cheapest is something called polymethyl methacrylate or PMMA. It's used in several intraocular lenses, but it had never been used in a glau glaucoma drainage device before. And also there was a company in Indonesia making lenses out of that material who could potentially have made these devices. So we decided to test this material make prototype uh, glaucoma drainage devices with it and test them in animals to make sure that A, they were safe and B, they were possible to manufacture. So this is one of our early prototypes and made in about 2014 after we'd been through several schematic drawings, dealing with the company to find out what they could and could not manufacture. It's a silicone tube, special material that's been laid and trimmed down and uh, the tube is glued into a hole here with two suture holes. It's made fairly thin and long, it's smooth, so it's easy to slide into the tissue. It's technically fairly easy to insert and operate. This is actually going into a rabbit's eye, it's part of the original rabbit surgery we did up in Indonesia to make sure that it was safe. Obviously, we don't want to put anything into a patient's eye unless we're very, very confident that it's going to be safe and not cause a problem. Now, we did the rabbit work and looked at all of the results there, presented that to the ethics committees, got their blessing to start doing human, <coughs> sorry, human trial in Indonesia. We were very careful originally about only putting in two tubes in patients who are already blind, just to make sure that there was nothing unforeseen that we hadn't predicted that might occur. We didn't want to cause any problems, but they went fine when we expanded the trial. And so this is the data from the first human trial over about 18 months. Now, a couple of things you'll notice is that the average pressure before surgery was 40 millimetres of mercury. These are patients who are on everything, who have generally had a trabeculectomy on all the drugs, including Diamox. Many of you here are my patients, and you know what I mean. If your pressure is 40 and you're on all the drugs and you've had trabeculectomy surgery, you know that I would be panicking and you would be panicking as well as soon as I mentioned that number to you on the other side of the slit lamp. 
So these are patients with very severe glaucoma. Interestingly, the more severe your glaucoma, that is the higher the pressure, the less likely you are to succeed with surgery. It's, it's actually a bad, I don't tell people this, because I don't like to scare them. And I shouldn't, now close your ears. We're going to give you something to make you forget, okay? But unfortunately it's true. If you have really high pressure before surgery, it's surgery's less likely to have a good long-term outcome. However, following these patients, and these are the numbers, this is 65 patients initially following them. And you can see that the pressures by and large were generally on average below 20 for 18 months, which is actually a very good result. So we were very pleased. We uh, showed this to the ethics committee up in University of Indonesia. They were very pleased as well. And we essentially launched the device nationally in June. Uh, and so now it's commercially available throughout Indonesia. Some 500 have been implanted and it, many surgeons there and are, are using it. And I'll show you some photographs. This is Dr. Werner Octariana and myself. This is in the University of Bogor doing the animal work. This is myself operating, inserting one of these devices in Denpasar, Bali. This is the actual device going into a patient's eye, the device. And this is uh, about six months post-operatively. Actually, usually the device is inserted a little bit higher up, so it's covered more by the upper eyelid, but it's still working very well in this particular patient. So. That's an example, both the Zen and the Verna GDD are examples of very practical outcomes of our research. And we're very proud of these outcomes and we want to do more research like this, which has very translatable, tangible results that improves people's vision. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, remember I said to you, you were going to become pressure experts. So I'm going to now delve into something a little bit more prosaic, but quite fascinating. And in this talk, we've been talking all about high eye pressure, right, which causes glaucoma. If you have the opposite, if you have high brain fluid pressure or CSF pressure, it makes you go blind equally well. I mean, it, it doesn't discriminate. It causes the same sort of forces on the nerve, but in the opposite direction. So this is some images. This is the schematic of a normal nerve. This is a schematic high pressure gradient going the opposite direction. This is swollen optic, no, sorry, this is normal optic nerve. <coughs> this is a, what it looks like looking at the optic nerve. This is a scan. You can see the swelling of the tissue in front. And this is the visual field, which looks exactly like somebody with severe glaucoma. So you get the same visual field loss and vision loss. If you have high brain fluid pressure for long enough, crush those optic nerve fibers for long enough. Now, at least when you have glaucoma and you have eye, high eye pressure, we can measure the eye pressure fairly easily with those little devices that bounce things off your cornea or touch the cornea with blue dye. Trouble with measuring brain fluid pressure <coughs> at the moment is that you have to stick a needle in your back, which is what neurologists do. It's called a lumbar puncture. This is the size of the needle. It's not, we don't show patients those needles because they'd run away. But that's actually what's going into your back when you have a uh, lumbar puncture, CSF pressure measurement. Or if you don't like that, the other option is have a hole drilled in your skull and one of these devices plonked in. That's not particularly, uh, fun either. Um, now, there's a few interesting things about uh, CSF pressure is that it, I won't go into the physiology, but imagine it's basically a circulating fluid flowing around the brain. It also goes down the spinal cord. Now, we live on earth and we have gravity. So it's a bit like a big bag of fluid that's sort of thinner at the bottom and thicker at the top. Gravity is pulling it down all the time. So the pressure on the bottom is a bit higher than the pressure at the top because of that dragging, suck, sucking effect, okay? And in fact, when you're standing or sitting like you are right now, the fluid pressure in the brain at eye level 
is about zero. This is the distribution here where zero pressure is. This is the patient's head and neck. It's about zero at this level at about eye level. When you lie down, because of the, the change of posture and the effect of gravity, the CSF pressure goes up to about 10 centimetres or 100 millimetres of water, which translates to about 10 millimetres of mercury on average. Don't worry too much about that. That's, but it, you'll see it becomes more interesting. Now, this is um, a kind of fun schematic photograph. What you're looking at top right is an analogous situation in the body. This is a picture of the heart pulsating. And if you look carefully, this is the atrium here. Blood's coming down from the neck into the atrium. It's contracting. Now, because it's contracting, it's sending a pulse wave backwards up into the neck. If you look carefully at a loved one, when you're sitting down, instead of looking into their eyes, look, look at their neck. And generally, you'll see a pulsation. That pulsation is the vein, and the pulsation is because of a pulse wave coming back from the heart into the neck. Now you think, oh, well, so what? Um, you know, it's interesting. Okay. The only other part of the body that you get that kind of thing happening elsewhere is in the eye, where the brain fluid pressure is also pulsating and it's generating a pulse wave to go up the vein back into the eye. And you think, oh, yeah, so what? That's kind of interesting. Well, it's actually quite interesting because all of a sudden it means that the brain fluid pressure pulsation is sending a signal into the eye across all of those vessels at the back of the eye, which we can potentially measure and start to infer various properties of brain fluid pressure, a bit like signal analysis. So we invented a system here about five years ago. And here you'll see, this is a normal optic nerve. Can you see this vessel here pulsating? It's a vein that's pulsating. I won't go into all the physics and the mathematics because it's a bit complicated. But essentially we can map the pulsation of all the vessels across the retina. We get these sort of curves. We can calculate the amplitudes. We can plot them. And we can then map the higher amplitudes, say in red, versus green versus blue. You'll notice here how the red corresponds with this zone here, which is where the pulsation is most easily visible. So it's mapping the pulsation amplitudes and calculating their amplitudes for us. We can also then do some very fancy mathematics and essentially use that like a spirit level where we change the pressure in the eye to match the pressure in the brain and then look, use fancy statistical methods to predict where that balance point occurs where that balance point occurs theoretically will be the balance between eye pressure and CSF pressure. So here, in this normal subject, I won't go through all this, balance point is about zero, which is normal when you're sitting or standing, which is when this image was taken. So that's a normal CSF pressure. This patient's got a swollen optic nerve. Actually, this is, was an interesting patient. This patient had known high pressures in the brain for 20, 30 years, had had about four lumbar punctures, didn't really want to have any more because she knew, she knew the size of that needle that they were going to poke into her back. And so the neurologist said, look, uh, I know these guys at Lyons, they've just set up an intracranial pressure assessment clinic uh, and you're telling me that you're, the ringing in your ears is getting a little bit worse we're not sure if we need to do another lumbar puncture, let them have a look at you. So this lovely young woman came and saw us and we had a look, did all this analysis. This is CSF pressure in the sitting position of 27 millimetres of mercury is actually very high. So we wrote back to the neurology or rang them pretty much straight away and said, look, she's got a much higher than expected CSF pressure. You probably should do a lumbar puncture and check it and then start her on more treatment and sure enough she did. So uh, this technique allowed us to set up this clinic and we provide information to the neurologists, which is useful. We're also 
we've seen enough patients now. This is a graph showing the relationship between our predicted intracranial pressure or CSF pressure versus the measured pressure when you either drill a hole in the head or poke a needle in the back. And you can see it's a pretty good straight line. It's, it's quite accurate. Uh, the average error is only about 2.4 millimetres of mercury, which is pretty low. And this is the only other technique out there which shows much greater scatter. So we're actually working on that at the moment to make a much smaller prototype system, which hopefully uh, we can test across a wider band of patients and eventually make available through commercialisation. But that, it is a longer term project. Now, I did promise you that I would introduce you to Butch Wilmore. He's actually commander of the International Space Station. You probably didn't know that. Now, just check his face. This is Butch when he's on Earth. He looks quite a handsome, rugged. Imagine he's come straight out of Texas, don't you? This is him in space. Can you, can you pick a difference? Is there a difference? He's swollen, isn't he? It's like he's done yoga for 10 years and hasn't stood up or something. I mean, I felt sorry for Butch when I saw him in that. Um, he's obviously having a fun time and he's going upside down and it's demonstrating that there's no gravity in space. That's the problem. There's no gravity in space. And so there's no dragging force on your CSF or your veins, for example. And poor old lymphatics don't know how to pump. They don't know which way is downhill, which way is uphill. Everything's confused in terms of the fluid in the, in the body. If you're an astronaut and you go up into space for six months or more, this is what generally happens to you. Your, your optic nerves go from normal to swollen. If you, oh, sorry. if you have an MRI scan when you come back, this is the CSF space. It's clearly swollen, isn't it? And it's pushing the eye, the optic nerve forwards. It's causing that papilledema, which is happening in more than 50% of astronauts if you're on the International Space Station for six months. So um, we've been doing some small amount of work with NASA for a couple of years, and we've been doing some tilt table experiments. I'm, I think I'm running out of time. So, sorry. Um, so, but I will show you these. These are quite fascinating. I have a wonderful master student, Joe Ku, and we've been doing these experiments on subjects sitting and lying down to look at whether our system can detect changes in the CSF pressure just in those postures. Now this is actually Joe's optic nerves, horizontal, so lying down and sitting. Look, I couldn't pick a difference, they, apart from one looking slightly larger than the other, simply because of the photograph, identical. But when you do the vein pulsation measurement system, there's clearly a huge difference in the CSF pressure effect there with the pulsation amplitude. So we're actually working with NASA to develop a system that might be small enough to take up to the International Space Station so we can begin tracking astronauts' CSF pressures indirectly. We don't want to poke needles in their back up on the space station. Um, and see what the time course is for the CSF pressure change up in space. So I'm going to summarise. I think you're all pressure experts now. Thank you. You've graduated. I won't set an exam, but I, I know that you've all passed. The, um, it's pressure difference across a structure that matters, and that generates forces. It's an underlying problem for glaucoma. Eye pressure greater than brain pressure by quite a lot gives you glaucoma. If you have the opposite way around, you get other, the opposite problem, but the same sort of outcome. Now, for glaucoma, the treatment is to lower pressure. And if we do surgery, we want it to be safe and also accessible for all. So we're working on ways of improving, for example, the Zen surgery. And ideally, hopefully, long-term aim is to make it accessible for all. Finally, CSF pressure is actually probably also important in glaucoma, but I won't go into that. At the moment, there's no easy way of measuring it without drilling holes or poking big needles. And so we're working on that project actively. And uh, it's a very exciting project with some fascinating physics and mathematics behind it. So thank you very much for 
an overdone talk, and I apologise for running over time. Thanks, Tom. Thank you very much, Professor Bill Morgan. I think that was absolutely fascinating. I'm sure you'll all agree. We have got some time for questions of Bill. So um, our microphone was giving us static. So just speak loudly or I'm able to repeat the question if, if you have a soft voice. So has anyone, yes, the gentleman there. So the question is, why do we have to go right across the eye to implant the Zen? Um, well, you don't have to, you could do it externally. So from the external side, the problem there is you don't actually know where you're going when you go inside the eye. So by going right across the eye, you actually do less damage because inside the eye, it's only fluid. You're not wrecking anything. Also with those little lenses you saw, you can actually, it's a bit like, you know, when you drive at nighttime and with the headlights on, do you want to see where you're going or do you want to drive blind? I mean, simple as that really. Um, so I prefer to drive with the headlights on and see where I'm going. Yeah. Any other questions? So. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks very much. It's 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 a fun topic. Yeah. yeah. Yes, the short answer is yes. It depends very much on the amount of scarring, um, whether they've been, occasionally there are surgical issues that reduce the effectiveness of the Zen. Uh, if that's the case, then a second Zen will often work very nicely. Uh, if there's a lot of scarring, and that's because, not because of the Zen itself, but just because how your body has reacted, it's unlikely a second Zen is going to work. So then we tend to go straight for a glaucoma drainage device, a bit like the Verna GDD. But, so it depends on the individual and how things have healed up afterwards. Oh, yeah, interesting question. Um, it has, a, has an effect on our what we, this measurement system we developed is called photoplethysmography. It has an, an effect on that's ability to measure the pulsation, but as far as we know, it doesn't have any adverse effect on the eye. So the question is whether lifestyle affects glaucoma. Yeah. Um, yes and no. A lot of people ask me if diet, you know, should I eat chocolate or beans or something, bilberry juice. Uh, look, none of that matters at all. There's no studies whatsoever that show any effect of diet upon glaucoma. Uh, however, exercise, physical exercise regularly done, does actually lower the intraocular pressure. So that's the one thing that you can do and is really advisable to do. Um, another thing people often ask is coffee drinking. If I drink coffee, there's various reports in the lay, in the sort of, if you look up Mr. Google, you'll find things about coffee and glaucoma. Um, most of that's rubbish. I was going to use a more profane word, but um, there was a quite a nice meta-analysis years ago looking at coffee. You really have to drink 10 cups a day for it to have any significant effect, and I doubt whether any of you are drinking 10 cups a day. So practically no. Ah, question is vitamin B3, can that help? If you're a rat, possibly yes. But that's only if under those rat experiments were a, a, an acute model, which doesn't really mimic glaucoma, and also they're a rat, not a human. So short answer is we don't really know. There's no hard evidence. Yeah. Ah. Question is, is there a linkage between tinnitus or ringing in the ears and glaucoma? No, there's no linkage at all, but there is a linkage between tinnitus and raised brain fluid pressure. So that was that particular patient. Yeah. The lady over there. 
Ah, that's a good question. There's a whole lot of causes. Uh, the commoner cause is unknown, but it's very strongly associated with being unfortunately obese, female and fertile, so in the sort of 20 to 40 year age group. Uh, and it's becoming more common because of the increasing obesity that we're seeing. Um, and it's probably got to, there are some hormonal changes there. It's more common in women who are on the oral contraceptive pill in particular, and there are some other drugs, some antibiotics in particular that can produce this. Now, so that's one set of causes. There are also, um, if you have brain tumours, for example, or head injury and some other causes inside the brain that will cause the brain fluid pressure to go up. So if we were able to, and interestingly, trauma to the brain like stroke and head injury is adversely, so the damage is worse if you have a high brain fluid pressure. And yet there's no simple way of measuring that. So we have people, the neurologists and the trauma surgeons at Royal Perth are, are actually quite interested in our system. Um, obviously we need to have a system that we can use in a portable manner because patients in that set circumstance can't sit up at our fancy machine there. So we're working on that at the moment. Ah, cannabis, is that the question? M marijuana and work. Yes, there is. Uh, I'll get asked this question quite a lot. Uh, it's been known that smoking ma uh, marijuana lowers the intraocular pressure for probably 30 years. Drug companies have been looking at trying to extract the active ingredient with unfortunately no success. They can't seem to separate the component that affects your uh, mental state, if you like, uh, from the bit that lowers the intraocular pressure. We did a small study many years ago on one particular compound and it didn't have any useful pressure lowering effect. Uh, also, if you smoke marijuana, the pressure lowering effect is fairly variable. It's not really very predictable, but yes, it does lower the intraocular pressure. Mm. It's something I can't professionally, officially recommend. Mm. Anyone else? One more? Yeah. It's a great idea. We've got um, two wonderful doctors from Indonesia in our audience, actually, um, and we're having discussions with them at the moment. Um, we have been working with Indonesia for Professor Constable, who many of you would know, actually began the work with Indonesia some 30 years ago. Correct me, Jacon, if I'm wrong, but I think it was about 30 years ago. And I was fortunate, to, oh, sorry, I'm gonna digress here. Uh, it's, a, it's a really fa interesting and fascinating story. I, Ian Constable asked me to go up with him and do some glaucoma surgery in Surabaya about 22 years ago. And I, we put in the first glaucoma drainage devices then. But as you say, I mean, there's not much point going up and doing, say, two at a time. You can't address the scale. So we've been actively involved in helping to teach people surgery and then more recently, as you see, building a device that then becomes accessible because it's fine to teach people, but if they can't afford to buy the device, they go back and you can't do the surgery because you can't afford to buy it. So uh, what's been fantastic about Indonesia, especially in the last 15 years, is how much the education has grown so that the number of ophthalmologists being trained is massive. For example, in Jakarta, there are about 70 registrars training in ophthalmology. 
here in West, the whole of Western Australia, there are 13. Um, and then that extends across other parts of Indonesia. So the government there has really pushed education, basically scaling up health provision. This is my interpretation. Uh, Jacques and Martin can definitely give you a much more detailed answer than I can. Um, but we're very interested in working with Indonesia. Uh, for example, the Verna is now putting in on average six of these glaucoma drainage devices per week. The busiest glaucoma surgeon in Australia would be lucky to put in one a fortnight. That gives you an example of the scale of the problem, but also what difference the teaching and providing a device uh, that's affordable can actually make. She and others are teaching other surgeons how to use the device. So we expect to see basically an exponential rise in the number of those glaucoma drainage devices being implanted over the next few years and just in a massive spread. I, I liken it to cancer. Normally I hate cancer, but this is kind of an example of a good cancer. We set up an infective metastatic focus somewhere and then get the conditions right and have it spread. So that's what I kind of wanted. The great thing from our perspective is that I used to go up to Indonesia and think that I was teaching young doctors. Now I go up there and I think I learn more than I teach. Because Verna is doing six a week, she has all these little tricks and tips that she says, oh, I've tried this and that. I think, oh, that's actually a good idea. I wish I'd thought of that. Or uh, whoever, you know, it, it's fantastic. So it, it's, it's been, it's a fantastic thing. Yeah. Right. You're quite right. We've hidden our light under a bushel. You're actually dead correct there. Thanks very much. Yeah. Another round of applause. Thanks.